done better. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the card said, you know, you crashed into our lives. I mean, obviously not the terminology you want to use with a survivor. But overall, the care team did a good job. And that's from years and years of learning experiences that we've had with previous incidences. You know, we're getting good at this now. Yes? How would you like to have been approached by your rights uh, of, as a survivor? The, the actual legal rights that you were entitled to. How would you have liked to have been approached? Would you like input? Someone explaining it? You know what? My, if my care team would have provided me with a standard disclosure, or even a le the letter that they gave to me was a standard letter, but it didn't explain anything. Exactly. And so, you know, other rights, I mean, um, you know, there's those people that immediately seek uh, legal. The thing of it for me was I didn't go out and seek legal immediately. I figured sooner or later some lawyer was going to come knocking at my door. So it wasn't at the top of my list. I mean, I was more concerned about my well-being you know, what I needed to do to reintegrate myself into, into my life. And so I wasn't really worried about that. Plus, I didn't want a hundred lawyers knocking at my door every day trying to get in contact with me. I was difficult to find in the first place before the accident. I wasn't in any phone book. You couldn't find me unless you had a driver's license number or a license plate number. You couldn't find me. And I didn't have a lawyer to contact me for, a lawyer cannot contact you for 90 days after an accident, unless you go out and, and, and look for them. So naturally, I didn't have a legal firm contact me almost till four and a half months after the accident. The consulting work I was doing, they let me go from that job. I, had a, I was jobless after the accident. So naturally, I went, I went into another job. I mean, I, I went into propane. Gosh, you go from one explosion to another, huh? So, um, you know, I just, I was more interested in that than I was legal at that point. I mean, legal was the last of my concerns. And a lot of people are like that. But receiving that money and a better explanation would have definitely helped. What you would, in the tax. Absolutely. One of the things, and one of the questions immediately when those checks got doled out was, What's the IRS's play in this? I mean, a lawyer actually had to get involved just to give us an answer. Or an IRS agent had to get involved to actually give us an answer on it, which was, it's tax exempt. I'm going to tell you guys, too, since you guys seem to be very interested in legal, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the per legal process here, OK? Because if you think that an accident makes you financially capable, you're very sadly mistaken because, let me tell you what happens. One of two things are going to happen. Either you come to a, uh, an idea in your head that you are going to settle out of court with these folks, or they're just going to hold you up for 10, 15 years. So if you want to sit out there for 10 or 15 years and continue to go over and over and over the situation, you're not going to start the healing process. Okay? It's just going to sit out there and stew. You're going to get frustrated, problematic. In this particular case, the judge died halfway into the case. Oh so they have to start over again. Oh. OK? So if 15 years, if you feel comfortable about waiting 15 years to get this put behind you, then I guess by all means. However, I wanted to move on with my life. And you've got to come to a realization that there's a point to where you're going to say, OK, Enough's enough. Let's just move forward. A lot of the passenger on board this aircraft actually came in off a connecting international flight. You know what that means, right? Their liability has been reduced because of Warsaw Convention. Okay? So whatever they received in that first initial check was all they got. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So, again, it's not a it's not a, always a windfall. Yes.
well, again, I mean, as archaic as it makes sound, archaic as it may sound, what was the one downfall? It was communication. I mean, if and again, and I can't. When I see ARF teams, I visit ARF teams, ARF teams in major airports, and we sit down and talk about an accident like this. We talk about communication because you have to have good communication between air traffic control, flight side of operations, so forth and so on, to make sure that this doesn't happen again. You know, I would have had difficulty making assessments. I probably would have had a little bit more flight mentality, you know, because I wouldn't have been able to make the assessments that I did with the, the, uh, with the aircraft. I mean, I, as a regular layperson, I didn't know with the hazmat situation and the fuel being all over the place, I didn't know if I was going to get an ignition or anything like that. That was one of the considerations on making the decisions I made. You know, was there enough rainfall to dilute that JP4 that's laying on the ground? You know, is there enough time to work around the aircraft before that fire gets back into the back engine compartment where you potentially have another ignition? or another explosion. Those are the questions that you're going through all the time. And a lot of people, they'll ask me in a class, they'll say, geez, you know, what were you thinking about? What were you thinking about just before that impact? Well, it's very, very interesting. For, I'll explain to you what I was thinking. I'm not saying everybody thinks this way. There's two trains of thoughts that are going through your mind. Number one, it's very, very amazing how your body can actually put yourself in kind of a state of grace meaning you're not worried about what's getting ready to happen to you. You are facing death, potentially, but you are so comfortable with the situation that you're okay with it. The other side, or the other train of thought is, your brain is going through so many different scenarios that you're thinking of preservation scenarios. How bad am I going to get hurt? How am I going to get out? You know, what if there's an explosion? All these are just firing off within fractions of seconds. So you've got two things going on at the same time. But it's very, very interesting how you actually can get yourself in such a comfortable state before something bad's getting ready to happen to you. Who else? You guys are quiet. Yes? No, actually, um, Denise Day left American uh, about two years after the accident. Boy, I tell you, after two incidents, that's pretty tough, especially those two. Um, the other flight attendant um, never had any contact. When you guys disengage, there's no more contact. The only time you're going to have contact again with, your with a passenger is if the passenger specifically requests it, potentially. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to let you me. Yes. My mom still gets Christmas cards from Denise, but she never has sent me a Christmas card or anything like that. She stays in contact with my mom. How does, what do you think about that? I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, I think that's, obviously, she's not with the airline anymore. So, um, you know, it's perfectly fine. In fact, she doesn't even really ask about me in the Christmas cards, which makes me think, geez, man, y'all forgot about me? Geez. Okay, I see how y'all are. Yes? They were always together. Always together. Oh, I mean, it was just like I was in a hen house. You know, it just, I, I mean, it was just, I couldn't even say anything. My mom was always giving up the goods all the time, you know, about everything. I mean, I get ready to say something, she'd cut me off. So, yes? Um, yeah, at some point, you're, two weeks is pretty adequate to actually stick around. I mean, after that, you're ready to kind of move forward and get integrated back in. I mean, from a male perspective, you know, you can only go so long with having a whole bunch of people in the house. And, you know, they didn't stay at the house, obviously, but, you know, they're always there during the day, scheduling, taking care of uh, cleaning, cl 
clothes, um, meal preparation, those kind of things. So after a while, you're ready for them to, it's not like get out or anything like that, but that's kind of, you know, after you spend so much time with them and learn a lot about them, it's pretty tough. So. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you guys, um, when I went through Dallas-Fort Worth with my two care team members, when I came into the gate of Dallas-Fort Worth, they already had one of the carts waiting for me there. And I could tell by looking at the people at Dallas-Fort Worth as we went by, they knew who I was, even though nobody told them, because they knew there was just an accident. The, uh, the uh, younger care team member, once you got to Dallas-Fort Worth, American has their family meet them there at the airport as they're passing through so they can see their family before they head towards their next destination. Um, the younger care team member actually broke down and started crying. That's how traumatic it was for her. So I'm not trying to scare you guys away. I can tell you from a survivor's perspective, and you can talk to any of the survivors on my flight, they are glad you are here. They think care team members do a great job. It's that initial, we talk about fog of war and dealing with what just happened. They're in that in-between phase where they just don't know what's going on. Okay, so you're going to get some real different reactions from people. Just hang in there. Hang in there, and it, it'll, it'll, within 48 hours, it'll start working itself out. Okay? Yes, sir. Well, well, and, and the, the, again, the key number one thing for the passengers is information. And information trickles so slow, that's the aggravating point for a lot of the passengers. Information. That's what they want. Information um, on what happened. Um, information on family members. Um, information on briefings. Information... Um, I just investigations, those kind of things. I mean, no, absolutely. So during that time frame, and what we usually see, I did a drill with U.S. Airways about a, a year and a half ago at Phoenix Sky Harbor. That first eight to 12 hours, that's rough, let me tell you, because when you're sitting in there in the family center with family in there waiting to find out, they all want information. But again, remember what I told you, first 24 to 48 hours, we really don't know. We just have basic information, that's it. And those pass or those, that family really wants the information to come in as quickly as possible. And that's where a lot of the rub is with the families. They want the information. That's why it's important for you guys because you're an advocate for them. Okay? Let me help you get to the briefing. Let me help you get that information. That's why you kind of have that upper hand because they're going to come to you and say, hey, Paul, I heard they're having a briefing about this stuff. Can you tell me about it and can you get me there? Okay? I'm the information person. I'm going to take you where you need to go to get that information. That's where you're important. Advocacy. Who else? Go ahead. You can ask me a real gritty question if you want, if it's on your mind. What's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? Go ahead.
do you want me to explain some of the items back there? They're in the in the red folder, they're actually, and I know I told a couple people, the actual manifest that the station manager printed off that night, he actually gave it to me three years later. It's sitting in there, which I guess that might I might be in trouble myself. I remember I will hunt you down with the dog. Yeah, so I, I might be in trouble now for disclosing that. But the manifest is back there. Um, I also have the NTSB letters from Jim Hall and some of the other individuals that I dealt with. The very interesting items, please don't be afraid to put your hands on it because it will put you right at the accident scene. I've got the, um, the clothing that I wore that night and feel free to pick it up and take a look at it. You'll actually see where the, hole, where the rod went through the hole in my pants. You'll also see that the care team could not get the stains out of my clothes. So those are sitting back there along with the hat I was wearing, the hospital gown uh, that I transferred into when I came into Arkansas Heart Hospital, a couple items from BMS Cat when they went ahead and um, re removed their belongings from passengers. There's a catalog back there that you can actually look through and those two cowboy boots there were actually in the hold of the, the cargo hold, um, already tagged by BMS. There's newspaper articles. And I think that is the only thing.